The tenth Sunday after Trinity. Let thy merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your people around the planet, that they may obtain what they desire. Make them to ask those things and seek those things that please you and bring good pleasure to your infinite mind through our only mediator, through his merits. Jesus Christ, your son, our savior. Amen. Turn to verse 1 of hymn 687. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark, never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Well, we turn to Robert... Dabney, professor at Union Seminary. He submitted these lectures at about 1878. He was a professor of systematics there. Uh, I think he went south for a while, if memory serves, and died down in Texas. I, I just forget, I should have probably brought it up. He was a coadjutant, chief of staff, so to speak, for. Um, General Stonewall Jackson. Uh, he, he wrote a very good biography of Stonewall Jackson. He fought for the Confederacy. As a, he was a chaplain. He had seminary training as well. And um, he will talk about General Jackson about many a night, a soldier who was watching over a bodyguard over General Jackson would see the man silhouetted on his knees. General Jackson believed that his duty to prayer and Bible was the same relationship that he as a military man sustained to his commanders. In his case, Bobby Lee. You have an appointment, you have an appointment. So he fulfilled his, discharged his spiritual duties with military discipline. If a point in time to pray, that's life. What as an old military guy myself, what's not the life about that? Now he get takes a lot of heat here because he supported the institution of slavery in the South. So of course some of the young Yahoos come along and say, well, everything else he had to do or say is illegitimate. And uh I don't care what your IQ is, you can't think emotionally. There's some things I don't like in Thomas Aquinas, but I don't throw the rest out. You follow my argument? I can do that with the person listening. I find some flaws in your character here, so I throw the rest of your life out. It's, it, anyways, you get my point. Uh, let, let's see, we've got a preface to the 1972 edition. I notice in my front that Regrettably, the last time I read this was in 2006. I read it once uh, in seminary as a book that was on loan from the library. But then it came out. Who published this? The Banner of Truth? No, it was out of it. They came out in 1976. That's the edition I have here. But no, they came out again with it. Anyways, enough on the preliminary stuff. Now by a note by uh, Prof. Martin Smith, who taught systematics at Reformed in Jackson. The Christian world will be greatly indebted to Zondervan Publishing for reissuing this work. A major work on systematic theology by Robert Louis Dabney. Dabney was a Southern Presbyterian who lived during the 19th century. Archibald Alexander, the founder of Princeton Seminary, said that he was the best teacher of theology in the United States, if not the world. His biographer, Thomas Carey Johnson, said of him in the life and letters of Robert Louis Dabney that he was entitled to the first place among the theological thinkers and writers of his century. 
And by the way, I put him up on the, certainly on the top shelf. Uh, Hodge Turretin, of course, is on the top shelf. Kelvin's on the top shelf for sure. That's a must read for every seminary student. And I got one or, one or two more in here, uh, WGT Shed's top shelf. I don't know how to compare them. One, two, three, four, five. I just, they're top shelf guys. And we're delighted. I, my first recollection upon reading this was, this man knows logic. I'm having tra been trained in logic way back years ago and having practiced just the, that disciplined way of thinking. Over the years, um, I could tell he was trained in logic just by the way he wrote. Also, that he was trained in the languages. That comes through. Um, he has some funny comment on bishops down on, down on page 700 or something. And on the prayer book, which was hilarious to read. He didn't like the prayer book. So I'm not going to toss out the other 95%, 98%. God has given us this man, this uh, yard adjacent to Hampton Sydney College, which is what, about 80, 100 miles from Richmond. A man who thus enjoyed a reputation among his own contemporaries, it's no wonder that Dabney was considered the single most influential man in the Southern Presbyterian Church through the height of his ministry, 1865-1895. Uh, we can put Robert Th Thornwall in there. He's buried down in Columbia. Uh, took my grandson to go see that. And what's the other guy's name? Gerardo. Draw a blank. Yeah, that's his last name. His family plots down in there too. Uh, Thornwell was a uh, great, and the Southern Presbyterians had a very distinctive cultural connectivity to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Even up to the nineteen fifties and sixties, they had an established program for the catechesis of the kids. I think, but maybe better than the Northern Presbyterians. They took that, and in fact, we got a church in town, ARP, it used to be with the PCUSA. They pulled out, but they're, they're part of that ethos of the past. They still, every Sunday, every Sabbath service, they read a couple of questions on the shorter catechism. That's the old Southern practice, and plus catechesis. So they still do catechesis over here. Great rector, great minister. Dabney was a native of Virginia, being born in Louisa County in 1820 of English and French Huguenot descent. He was educated at Hampton Sydney College, Virginia, where he's born. The Virginia University of Virginia and U Union Theological Seminary at Hampton Sydney. Union used to be in Hampton Sydney, and then at some point they moved to Richmond. And I had always assumed that, and I think. Maybe he was at the, ha the Union in Richmond. He was buried for some reason at Hampton College. He was ordained to the ministry of the Presbyterian Church in 14, 1847. He spent his first six years of ministerial life in the historic Tinklings Springs Church in the Valley of Virginia. In 1853, this is before the Civil War now, he was called to the chair of Ecclesiastical History and Polity at Union Seminary. In 1859, he transferred to the Department of Systematic Theology. In 1860, he received a call to join the Princeton Theological Faculty. Whoa, this is before the Civil War. <clears throat> I didn't know it was that extensive. Due to his allegiance to the South, he felt he could not go north at that time. During the war between the states, he served briefly as a chaplain in the Confederate Army and later as chief of staff, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Chief of staff, I said adjutant. Same, well, yeah, it is different. Chief of staff's the number two guy, like the XO, executive officer. 
So as such, he would have been involved in all military decisions. Uh, he would have been the guy pulling the strings with the senior officers. With the rank of major, he served under Jackson during the rigorous Valley Campaign of 1862. Jackson said of him that he was the most efficient officer that he knew. After Jackson's death in May 1863, Dabney was requested by Mrs. Jackson to prepare a biography for the general, and it's a superb biography. Uh, Marine officers often read that biography. Marine officers have uh, reading lists that are prescribed by the Commandant of the Marine Corps for professional development, and they get together as officers part of their training, ongoing training. And they take trips here and there, and they study battle campaigns, and they study leadership styles, and biographies, all that kind of stuff. This was published in 1866 under the title, The Life and Campaigns of Lieutenant General Thomas J. Jackson. It is considered one of the best biographies of General Jackson. Jackson. It remains a major literary production of Robert Dabney. Following the war, Dabney returned to Union Seminary and continued to teach in the field of systematic theology until 1883. So this makes him roughly the uh, same time period as Charles Hodge, 1820 and what, when did he die? 1820, we'll figure that out as we go. He then moved to Texas where he became a professor on the faculty of the Young University of Te Texas and the chair of mental and moral philosophy and political economy. He taught there from 1883 to 1894. During the same time, he, together with Reverend Robert K. Schmoot, established the Austin School of Theology, which was later to become the Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He died at Victoria, Texas, on January 3, 1898, and was buried at Hamden, Sydney College. I got, I've been up there a couple of times, and so I want to get my son up there. And William Peck was another professor of theology there. He's buried like 10 feet from, 10, 15 feet from where Dabney was. I'll, I'll not forget finding Dabney's cemetery and then going over to the library. <laughs> And the archivist, I go in there, start asking some questions, and he just lit up like a bulb. Oh man, he would be. I love archivists, and we get on well. And he was bringing this out and bringing that out, and going through it. And of course, I'm excited and digging around, reading, you know, the old manuscripts. They got some of his collection there. And then they had a big oil painting on the wall in the library. It was really a delightful afternoon with, with the archivist. Dabney was, first of all, a teacher. His principal work was in the classroom where he set forth with intensity and vigor the principles of the Reformed faith. He was also prolific as a writer, producing a number of articles. Yeah, he was. I remember that. I mean, there's just tons of stuff that are in his records. He wrote a defense of Virginia in the recent and pending protests, contests over the second sectional party of 1870, a book called Sacred Rhetoric. I've heard that's good. I've never read that. I think Dr. Andy Underhill has read it, highly recommends it. Present work was published by Dabney's students under the title Syllabus and Notes of the Course of Systematic and Polemic Theology Taught in Union Theological Seminary, 1878. <coughs> the work was revised by the author and reissued later in 1878. 
It has seen six editions, the last being 1927. He also wrote two volumes in the field of philosophy, The Sensualistic Philosophy of the 19th Century, 1875, and Practical Philosophy, 1896. <laughs> the present volume was first published by Dabney's students with his permission. He later went over it and brought it into its present form. This volume reflects his rather unique way of teaching theology. Thomas Carey Johnson, his bio biographer, discusses it thus. Two class meetings were devoted to each topic, separated by the interval of two days. At the close of the second meeting, the class found on the blackboard a syllabus of the topic next to be taken up. The leading points in the topic were stated in the form of questions and authors treating that particular point. The most important reference was written first, the next more, most important second, and the third students were urged to read as many as they could. The textbook was Turretin in Latin. The next meeting he held a recitation on Turretin covering 10 to 12 pages. Students were required during the second or interval of two days to write each one his own thesis upon the topic. The second hour of the class meeting, he spent delivering to the class his own lectures on the same topic. These syllabi and lectures composed the main part of his work on theology. In the original note to the readers, it was indicated that the lectures assumed as a postulate established by another department in the seminary, the inspiration and infallibility of scriptures. The general order of material covered is that of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It is regrettable that we do not have Dabney's own development of the doctrine of inspiration of scripture. <clears throat> we find on page 144 his position stated without equivocation. <clears throat> I hold the scriptures to be in all its parts of plenary inspiration. This having been settled, we may proceed to assume them as inspired and infallible. <laughs> the work remained the textbook and systematic at theology at Union Seminary until 1930. It is fresh, masterful exposition of the Reformed faith. And that was by... Anderson Leith or Leith Anderson, he was a Southern Presbyterian writing about the great changes in the 1950s and 1960s that the Southern Presbyterian ministers had lost the confessional faith. Uh, well, you give up Dabney in 1930, what else? Something's going to fill the vacuum. Um, Dabney's influence was most strongly felt in Southern Presbyterian circles. This volume, as we've already noted, became the, the textbook of systematic theology in Southern seminaries. It was not it was not used at Westminster in my time, 1980. It was not used at Reformed Episcopal Seminary. I, of course, they only used Burkhoff, and that was it. it was not really. A, I don't remember how. They, I, all I know is. Bishop Leonard Riches would come in, sit down, open the book like this, and read like I'm doing. Uh, I thought kind of curious. But rarely offered too many side directions. He was recognized by Auguste Le Cerf of France in his introduction. Reform dogmatics. I got a surf over there somewhere. And, Herb, and Herman Bovink of the Netherlands in his Harifa Mirda Dogmatique as being among America's outstanding theologians. At a time when church, the church is certainly in need of a clear voice with regard to her theology, I can think of no finer work than that of Robert Dabney to be reproduced and set forth for our generation. I'm, I'm with Prof on this. Prof. Smith's uh, a genteel post-millennial, post-millennialist. He's not like the Reconstructionists who 
claimed to love God and hate everybody else. Martin Smith held his views but was loving. High proponent of the law of God, of course, in a post-millennial sense, uh, but able to act lovingly toward those who are on mill or even more narrowly pre mill. So there's some reform people that are. Well, here we are, um, lectures in systematic theology. Um, we'll have to get the, our sea legs here. He goes lecture by lecture. Um, we're on lecture one, preface. What is theology and what's its division? Prove that there is a science of theology. Turret and Thornwell. Interesting. What two lines of argument prove the existence of God? What are the a priori arguments? Are they valid? Stillingfleet, well, Thornwell, Dr. Samuel Clark, Chalmers. I'd like to read that too. Dick. So you got students. I don't think they own these books in the 19th century unless they're rich, probably over there in the library. You got to sit there and write out your own answers, read the authors. Curious. State the arguments of Clark, of Howe. Are they sound? Are they a priori? Cavill or Kant? The Platonic scheme? Wow. State the argument of Breckenridge's theology. I think that's the grandpa. He was a Presbyterian minister of B.B. Warfield. Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield. I think so. On his mother's side. I've not read it. Record Ridge. I think again, I think Dr. Andy Underhill has. And give knowledge of God is objective. Give an outline of argument from design, be the teleological, but they had to read Paley. <coughs> My Anglican. Xenophon's memorabilia, Cicero, Turin. And, and the supposition here is that the theological student could read Latin. Episcopal clergy, you don't have to read anything. No Greek, no Hebrew, no Latin. Used to be at Westminster, you had to have Latin before you entered. I don't think they require that anymore. Let's move along. It's justly said. I don't think we can finish the first lecture today. No, we won't. He's going to be going through the, the arguments for the existence of God. It is justly said every science should begin by defining its term in order to shun verbal fallacies. I want to see really clear writing with this man. It's a real joy. The word theology, theo and logos, has undergone gone peculiar mutations in the history of science. The Greeks often used it for their theories of theogony and cosmogony. Aristotle uses it, I never knew this, in a more general form as the equivalent to all metaphysics, divide, dividing theoretical philosophy into philosophical, mathematical, and theological. Many of the early church fathers used it in the restricted sense of the doctrine of Christ's divinity, Ioannes ha theologos. But now it has come to be used commonly to describe the whole science of God's being and nature in relations to the creature. The name is appropriate, science of God. Thomas Aquinas, Theologica a doctor, a deo docetur, deum docet, a deum ducet. Theology teaches toward God, teaches God, leads to God. Very nice. Quote from Thomas Aquinas there, which shows that the Reformed have their hands in other, other volumes and a lot of things that Robert Dabney would probably take issue with in Aquinas, as do I in uh, the issue of the fall. God is its author, its subject, its end. The distribution of theology into didactic, polemic, and practical is sufficiently known. Now, all didactic inculcation of truth is indirect refutation of the opposite error. Polemic theology has been defined as a direct refutation of error. 
The advantage of this has been supposed to be that the way for easiest and most thorough refutation is to systematize the error with reference to its first principle or proton pseudos. But the attempt to form a science of polemics different from didactic theology fails because error never has a true method. Confusion is its characteristic. The discussion system of discussion formed on the false method cannot be scientific. Hence, separate treatises on polemics have usually slidden into the methods of didactics or they have been confused. Again, indirect refutation is more effectual than direct. Therefore, it is in the course no separate polemic. But what is said against the errors is divided between historic and didactic. Is there a natural science? He asks. And he will do this throughout the entire book, is my recollection. He takes the questions and answers them. Very nice. <coughs> theology, theology is divided into natural and revealed according to the sources of our knowledge of it. From natural reason, from revelation. What is science? Knowledge demonstrated and methodized that there is a science of natural theology of at least some certain connected propositions, although limited and insufficient for salvation at best, is well argued from the scripture. Then the standard text, Psalm 19, Acts 14, 15, Acts 17, Romans 1, 19, of course, Romans 2, 14. From the fact that nearly all heathens have religious ideas and rites of worship. Not that religious ideas are innate, but the capacity to establish some ideas from natural data is innate. Consider further, is not this implied in man's capacity to receive a revealed theology? Does revelation demonstrate God's existence or assume it? Does it rest the first truths on pure dogmatism or on evidence which man apprehends? The latter and then man is assumed to have some natural capacity for such apprehension but if the nature reflects any light concerning God, as scripture asserts, that man is capable of deriving some theology from him. We love the fret like WGT shed. We love them for his clarity, directness, logic. We don't agree everywhere, but you better be ready to defend your thesis where you differ with the good man. Uh, let us pray. Lord, Make us to ask the things that make you happy, that we as your servants may serve you, knowing of your good pleasure and delight in us as your people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.